Joining us to talk about the Saints, guy that does a terrific job covering the Saints. He has for several years. He he did so for, of course, the local newspaper for quite some time, which uh, was online as well, and then departed for about a year. But he's back now and better than ever. And you can check him out at NewOrleans.Football. That's NewOrleans.Football. He does as good a job breaking down video and analyzing the game as anybody in the industry, it's great to have Nick Underhill joining us. Nick, listen, thanks, and you belated uh, welcome back as well. Hey, I, I appreciate it, and thanks for having me. Well, first and foremost, I guess the you know the million dollar question. None of us really knows, and Sean Payton talked to CBS Sports last night, but I don't think any of us knows about what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. Is training camp going to take place as scheduled in late July? Will the preseason happen as scheduled? And with the regular season, will there be fans in the stands and my guess is there's going to be football. I feel certain about that. How it happens, I do not know. Do you have any particular take on any of this? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing just like you, and I, I think we're in the same boat. I, I would be shocked if they don't find out a way to have a season. You know, I, I think these guys would do probably just about anything to, to put games on TV. I mean, there, there's billions of dollars on the line. And even if that were like a, you know, quarantine to a specific location type thing, which – I don't know if they'll have to go that far, but if that were the case, you know, I've talked to some different agents and that, and their players are, are ready to do, you know, kind of anything because, look, not everybody's making, you know, Drew Brees money. A lot of guys need their checks and they spend their money and they weren't expecting a stoppage in pay. And, you know, if they don't play, they don't get paid either. So I think, you know, whatever it takes, they'll go as far as they can to, to put games on. And I think they would exhaust every last option. You know, personally, being in the media, you know, if you ask me to guess today what it's going to look like, you know, for us, I, I'm not fully expecting to see a player in person the whole year. I'd be surprised if we're in the locker rooms this year, um, you know, unless a vaccine comes out of nowhere. But it doesn't sound like there's anything on the immediate horizon. So, I mean, you know, if I, if I had to place a wager, I, I wouldn't expect to be in a stadium. I wouldn't expect to see fans in a stadium. You know, I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I'm kind of, you know, preparing for for that scenario right now. What did you make of Sean Payton canceling all off-season activities? And some people, of course, have raised their eyebrows about that. Uh, as time goes on, it's not looking like it was as big a deal anyway because things keep getting pushed back with regard to the league allowing people to gather. Yeah, I mean, I, I think their their team's built to not have to do that. And, you know, these guys have been around long enough. Having a, you know, getting together on Zoom to lift weights or, or something like that, if you have to do that with your team and make sure – you know, they're, they're providing evidence that they're actually doing what they need to do. You know, you probably don't have the right guys around anyhow. And, you know, I, I do think that this offseason is in an odd way advantageous to a team like the Saints that have a lot of continuity. Um, you know, the main guy that they brought in this offseason, Emmanuel Sanders, he's he's moved around a little bit. You know, he went to San Francisco midway through the season last year and picked things up pretty quickly. Um, so I don't think it's going to be an issue for him getting up to speed. He, he was on a conference call yesterday with uh, – some fans, some luxury suite uh, ticket holders, Saints put that on. And, you know, he, he said that he's already got a pretty clean concept of the playbook. He, he, he understands what he needs to do. Just It's basically getting on the field and, and running routes the way that, that Breeze wants them to and finding out how that's done. Uh, Ruiz is the only guy that I would be a little bit worried about, you know, getting up to speed. But I think you could probably plug him in at guard. I think they would like to have him at center, but the learning curve there – We'll see how that works out. You know, figuring out their cadences and, and snapping the ball on time and all that is going to be a little bit of a process. And, you know, I've been told it took Eric McCoy a few weeks to kind of get that down last year in uh, in training camp. And there were, you know, plays where Toronto's two yards down the field before he even gets a snap off because that's, you know, what the cadence called for. And, you know, it's just that chemistry there that I, I think is going to be, you know, the big question uh, on the offensive line. But like I said, I, I think he can go a guard and they'll be fine. So, I mean, those are really the only two question marks they have going into the season, guys that they're going to be relying on that don't have a ton of familiarity. So, you know, it. I don't think it's a big deal. I, I know they're, they're doing video calls with the coaches, um, you know, guys that need help, the help's available. It's just they aren't working out on, on you know, a broadcast, which I don't think they really need to do it. Intelligence plays such a big role in personnel decisions. Of course, nothing is more evident of that than the NFL draft. And 
We all know what transpired where the Saints were concerned. The Chargers thought the Saints were going to take Murray, so they jumped ahead of them and drafted Murray. And meanwhile, the Saints, as you've spoken about uh, via Jeff Ireland's comments to the Louisiana Lafayette Athletic Foundation, Ireland said that he thought that there was a real possibility that Miami and Kansas City would take Cesar Ruiz. Therefore, the Saints took him where they selected him. Thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, I think it was a good pick for them. I, I'm a little bit surprised. You know, I, I guess heading into it, I kind of thought that they would be trying to replace Pete uh, and not Larry Warford. And I think maybe they kind of thought that as well. You know, Pete shot out there on the open market until Friday of, of the week of free agency. So that was, what, six days into it. And the comment Mickey Loomis made right away coming out of it was that they were surprised they were – they were able to get him back at that money. They, they thought he was going to price himself out. And Kansas City was a team, you know, they, they lost on, on the, the rookie, and they also wanted Pete. So I don't know if that's an eye for an eye for uh, losing Patrick Mahomes, but, you know, at least the Saints kind of blocked them on, on something that's payback. But, uh, yeah, look, I, I think it's a, it's a good move for them. Um, you know, Warford, he, he had surgery late last year. He came into camp, was out of shape ended up in Sean Payton's doghouse and we've seen how that's played out, you know, in recent years, Willie Sneed was someone who ended up in there and, and never got out. You know, you can debate on Delvin bro, but he ended up in there too. The, the, that was the last straw. I don't know if the misdiagnosis really should have been the last straw for him, but there were other events that kind of, you know, were leading him into that, that situation too. And Warford ended up in, in the doghouse. They were upset. He wasn't in shape. Uh, you know, Peyton was on him all year, and it got to the point where, you know, it was, it was time to move on. They got Pete back. It'll, I think it gave him the, the latitude to get rid of uh, Warford and make that move a year early than, than they were going to. And, you know, they ended up with the guy that they, they really liked with, with Ruiz. And, uh, you know, I, I think he fits the profile of their team a little bit better. They've built, you know, you take off all, all five starters now, add their 40 times together, divide it by five. It's the second fastest starting offensive line in the league. And that's not maybe the greatest measure to, you know, for for an offensive line, how many times are you running 40 yards in a line in a game? But, you know, they're a zone blocking team and their guys play out in space and they like to throw screens. So, you know, having guys that can get down the field and book it. And if you can get McCoy eventually at guard and off the center, he runs a 4.8940. And if you're talking about pulling and, and getting into the second level and blocking on screens, that's going to be a tremendous asset for them. And I think Warford was like the third or fourth slowest guard in the NFL. So just the way their line was evolving, I don't think he quite fit. And then you add in the fact that for at least half the season, they felt he was out of shape. You know, it's just, it's just a tough situation for them. So, you know, I, I do like the move. Um, you know, I, I don't think people are ever super excited when, when a team drafts an interior offensive lineman, but, you know, everybody wants a great offensive line, and everybody hates drafting one, but there's nothing worse than watching a line that can't protect the quarterback. And, you know, the Saints have done a really good job, I think, through this rebuild since, you know, 2016, 2017, you know, really focusing on the trenches and, and building from the line out. And, you know, it, it's it's been key to their success, and they're going to keep it going. No question. Uh, now three first-round picks on their offensive line, three first-round picks on their defensive line, and, of course, you can throw in a second, a third, and a fourth in there, too, on both sides. So clearly the way they've built this team. You can throw in Brandon Cooks as well as another one of those guys that was in the doghouse and led to what transpired yeah. there. And then historically speaking, Nick, with regard to what happened at guard here, they made the investment in Pete, who was an investment of theirs as a first-round pick, rather than Warford, is somewhat reminiscent of what happened in 2011 after that season when they decided to invest in Jari Evans in that year and did not invest in Carl Nix, who were the best pair of guards in the NFL at that time. And the answer to that, the reason for it is you you can't afford everybody. You just can't put all of your money into one position, especially at guards. So that obviously played a big role in this. Yeah, it didn't look I mean, I'm I'm not gonna lie, when they spent the money on Pete, I was I was a little bit surprised. Like really fifty seven point five million for him. And, you know, I, I've kind of spent some time, you know, putting aside my thoughts on it and trying to figure out what they were thinking. And, you know, the one thing I was told is that when they evaluate players, bringing them in, even looking at their own guys, one of the first things they do is they look at their, their big plays. So, like, say they're, they're getting a wide receiver. They'll pull up every play over 20 yards. They want to see the splash plays because that allows them to set a ceiling 
And then they work from there and try to figure out, okay, with our coaching, how much of this can we maximize? Can we spread it out? Can this become more of the norm? And can we eliminate the bad stuff? And, you know, if you do look at Pete when he's healthy, he's always down the field. He's great in the screen game. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon to see him blow a guy up on the line and knock him back three yards. And, you know, when you do that, you got a rushing lane for the running back. And basically all they got to do is, is see the hole and it's a five-yard game. The problem with him is that when he loses, it looks terrible because, you know, he's kind of a kill shot guy. And the, the things that allow him to blow a guy back three yards, you know, he gets his feet moving. And, you know, it's kind of like a boxer taking a big swing. You're opening yourself up for a counter punch. And he takes those counter punches and, you know, ends up on his back a little bit. So his bad plays look terrible compared to somebody else who might just lose a block and, you know, give up a, a pressure, but he's not, you know, laying on the turf while it's happening. So, you know, he, he definitely needs to get better. But I think I think there is a scenario where he gets healthy and, you know, he just keeps working to clean up some of the stuff and, and he'll be worth the money. But, look, I mean, Kansas City wanted him. He sat out there for five, six days. You know, I know people around here don't have the highest opinion of Pete. And again, I, I put myself in there as someone, you know, I don't think he's as bad as people say, but I didn't think he was, he was 57.5 million, but Kansas city wanted him. I mean, somebody set his market and they were able to get him back at a price. It wasn't like the saints let him sit there for a week and we're like, okay, here's all this money. No, I mean, that, that's what the league told you he was worth. So it's not just their evaluation. It's, it's, you know, it's the league. So um, you know, I, I'm interested to see how he comes back because I, I thought 2017 was really good. And when he was really good, their screen game was really good. But he's been hurt for two years and the screen game hasn't been as good. So it seems like there's probably a little correlation there. So, you know, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how he uh, rebounds. Another aspect of the intelligence game surrounded Tommy Stevens and the fact that the Saints traded back into the draft, gave up a draft pick to get him. And, of course, Sean Payton said afterwards that, he realized that Carolina was going to sign Stevens. And, you know, did they do that just to block Carolina or did they like him that much? Or maybe is it a little bit of both? I think it's a little bit of both. But, I mean, you kind of got to, <laughs> you kind of got to laugh at that whole situation. You know, Sean wasn't going to let this guy that came up in, in his building, you know, steal his player. And, you know, that's kind of his mentality overall. Like he's, he's not somebody that, that likes to lose. He, he gets, you know, I think a little worked up now and then. And, and you kind of even see it in his coaching. He comes up with a play that, you know, he likes. And he's not saving that red zone play for, you know, the fourth quarter trip to the red zone. He's he's running it the very first time they get in there. So it's just uh, that ultra competitiveness. And, you know, I do think that they, they like him. And I also think, you know, Taysom Hill, the last time we talked to him, mentioned that he wanted to back off on, on some of the special teams aspects and that. And I think bringing in Tommy Stevens gives them another guy kind of in that mold that they can start at page one of the Taysom program and, and maybe work him up. And while he's doing all this other stuff, you know, I, I think it, it gives Tommy Stevens an opportunity to develop a little bit as a quarterback. And maybe if he wasn't able to do the special team stuff or wide receiver, you know, may, maybe he wouldn't have that same opportunity. So, you know, I, I think there's some long tail to this situation, but also just in the short term, I, I think it's just, you know, a very good athlete that they think they can use uh, a number of different ways. A couple of more minutes with Nick Underhill of New Orleans Not Football. Schedule sets up well early, it appears to me, where the Saints are concerned. Uh, they're a season team. They get Tampa Bay with a new quarterback, new look uh, starting off. And, and then, of course, they play teams that they'll be favored against the first five games. Uh, they will certainly be favored prior to the bye. It gets very heavy Later in the season, obviously, three straight road games and then the three straight home games against tremendous opponents at one stage as well with San Francisco, Kansas City, Minnesota. But again, I think that this whole thing, barring any injury, sets up pretty well for the Saints to be another 12-4, and 13-3 and three year. You see it that way as well? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I think it sets up for them to kind of get off to maybe it's like seven and one start, six and one, you know, the Packers is really the only game and that first stretch that you look at and you think that, you know, maybe they could lose it. Um, you know, other than that, there's just really not a whole lot there. And, you know, I think they're catching Tampa Bay at the right time. We, we were talking, you know, one of the first things when I came on here, we were talking about the, the hospice season uh, program and everything. And, 
you know, Tom Brady's obviously been around for a very long time, but a quarterback with a new team and it's off season, it's already condensed. And if they, you know, they lose more practice time, you're, you're catching them at the right time. So, you know, that first meeting with them should be a lot easier than the second meeting with them. And, you know, basically the Saints schedule, it kind of feels like the whole season's packed into November and December. And, you know, for a team that, that is bringing back a lot of guys that played a lot last year, they should be able to kind of get into their groove early. And while other teams are working on chemistry, you know, the Saints are already going to have some of that built in. So that first half looks great. And then, you know, the second half of the season, they'll just, they'll be probably more together and, and ready to go and set up after uh, a softer schedule to, to make that run to the, the second half of the season. You know, I agree, probably 13 and three, something like that. You know, a game like Denver gets a little bit harder because it's in the middle of a, of a three-game stretch. They're probably going to lose a weird game somewhere because that's how it always goes. But looking at it, I mean, it, it looks good for them. And, yeah, I'm with you. I think 13-3, and three, uh, you know, 12-4, and four, I would say, is the worst-case scenario for them. So, you know, I just think that their roster is probably better than everybody else's. And, you know, the schedule, they, there's a couple of hiccups in there maybe, but I, I don't think it's anything that they can't overcome. Final thought, NFC, San Francisco, obviously, defending champion. You've got Seattle, which is a good team. Green Bay was in the the NFC Championship game a year ago. I certainly think Dallas has a chance to step up if they can solve their quarterback's contract situation because of their personnel and the fact that they've got a Super Bowl-winning coach now. Uh, how do you see the NFC in terms of the top four or five teams? I think you kind of just ended. I'm, I'm curious for your thought on this because I look at San Francisco and for some reason I just can't get my head around them being back there next year. I just feel like they're a team that's kind of due for a little bit of regression, playing a first place schedule. Uh, you know, their their division is going to be tougher. Arizona is going to be a little bit better. I mean, they're going to be a good team. I just don't know if they're like the best team in the NFC. I don't know. Am I crazy? No, I think they, they lost a key defensive lineman, obviously. They yeah. lost a key wide receiver, obviously. Uh, and I wonder about that Super Bowl hangover because, again, this is a team that controlled that game, looked like for all the world like they were going to win it, and they did not. And when it mattered most, their young quarterback, who had his best game ever against the New Orleans Saints last year, <laughs> did not perform well. And I just wonder if there's a carryover, much like we saw with the Los Angeles Rams after their Super Bowl, and much like we saw with Jared Goff and the way he performed the following year. I think there is a parallel there. Yes, yeah, so, so do I. And look, I mean, Shanahan can make any quarterback look great, but, you know, I think Garoppolo kind of showed some flaws as the season went on. So I, I don't know. I mean, I wonder if that stuff affects him, his confidence or anything like that. I, maybe not. He seems like a confident guy, but you're missing some key throws in the Super Bowl that, that cost your team a game. And, you know, everybody's talking about it, and they're talking about bringing back Tom Brady to replace you because you're not good enough. You know, I, I just think all mm-hmm. that stuff could, could mess them up a little bit. So, yeah. you know, I, I think the Saints are the team to be. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, be a New Orleans guy here or anything, but they just look like they have the best roster to me. And the way this offseason sets up, I, I really think it creates, like, a really weird advantage for them, you know, inadvertently. But they're a team that I think will know how to take advantage of it.